Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. It is one of the few Shakespearean plays without any carnal relations. There's not a single body quibble. It's concerned primarily with political rivalry, uh, martial competition, and the disillusionment of ideals. It's one of the most subtle and sophisticated of his plays, and it addresses the nature of kingship, the relationship between the public and the private self, the limits of reason, and the necessity of coming to terms with the irrational, the world that's beyond reason, as it presents itself in omens, and portents, and soothsayers, dreams, and signs. For Elizabethan audiences, the play was not some faraway escapist historical drama, but the opposite. Indeed, it was a powerful lesson on modern ethics and statescraft. The Greeks and Romans provided models of conduct that the lessons of history could and should learn. Plutarch's parallel lives of the noble Grecians and Romans and Sir Thomas North's 1579 translation had an enormous influence on Shakespeare's plays and the way Elizabethans looked at their own history. Like Queen Elizabeth and her father, Henry VIII, Caesar is a monumental monarch, both loved and feared. Each were rulers without an heir, as Shakespeare's Caesar makes clear in scene two when he urges Antony to touch Calpurnia when he races in the feast of the Lupercal, the ancient festival of fruitfulness and fertility. Quote, for our elders say, the barren touched in this holy chase shake off their sterile curse. This is not in Plutarch. Shakespeare adds it to help make his point. Caesar's concern for an heir is an alarm bell for Brutus's fears, lest Caesar intend to found a hereditary dynasty preempting the free choice of the people in a republic. To both Elizabethan England and the Rome of Julius Caesar, civil war was one of the most dreaded political consequences, a war both of triumvirs versus triumvirs and of Brutus with himself at war. Brutus is torn by his own conflicting feelings between his private friendship with Caesar and his public dislike of kingship and dictatorship of any absolute rule that approaches the condition of Godhead. The presence of a modern cloak, an anachronism, in Act 2, Scene 1, is not an accident, but reminds the audience of the double time period in which the play is set. It's a history both of the classical past and a story of the present day 1599. The clock abruptly jars the audience from any complacency about the difference between then and now. Brutus's moral struggle occupies the moral center of the drama, and it is Brutus who names himself, quote, poor Brutus, with himself at war. Like Henry IV, who precedes him, and Macbeth, who follows him, Brutus suffers from the malady of sleeplessness, caused mostly by turmoil and guilt. Like Macbeth and Hamlet, Brutus hesitates on the brink of a cataclysmic action, once again, psychomachia, the struggle for control of the soul, is figured here in an image of civil war, or to put it differently, the outside has become the inside. The ghost Brutus will see is a mirror as well as his vengeful victim is. And more than any other, Brutus is the great man who falls, the play's tragic center, the largest speaking role by far, and even the play's epitaph is about Brutus and not Caesar. It's a haunting account of homage and loss. Brutus's trust in the power of order and reason and discourse in the state is his downfall. His sense of honor, the word that most typifies him until death, is unrealistic. It's not a gauge of the real world. He chooses a particular soldier with some smatch of honor to hold his sword when he takes his life. Uh, suicide was regarded for the Romans as a noble death, especially when used to preserve one's dignity after a military defeat. It was the high Roman fashion that ends up taking the lives of Brutus, Brutus Cassius, Antony, Varus, uh, and others. It is easier to die by honor than it is to live by it. The play has Caesar's name out of formality and convention. Caesar is the ruler, but he's also the topic. The conundrum of this play, who or what is Julius Caesar? Who or what would Julius Caesar be had he been allowed to continue his rule? There are two Caesars. There's the mighty public become a god Caesar, and there's the uh, airless, tired, uh, shaken in the Spanish campaign, had to be saved from the river, cried out uh, for a drink like a sick girl, uh, the private man who's superstitious and who may have epilepsy. 
This dichotomy is underscored again and again by Caesar. The difference between bodily infirmity and mythic fame is a difference in time and timelessness. Always Caesar. There is a difference Brutus will fail to take into account when he joins the conspiracy. Brutus should not be surprised Caesar is mighty yet, since Julius Caesar is both a concept and a person, and later an entity that haunts the characters in the play, including Brutus himself. Caesar's deafness is proverbial as well as physical. He himself is more persuaded by the existence of the public Caesar than of the private man. He regularly refers to himself in the third person, always something to be on guard for. And as an instrument rather than as a man, this runs counter to Brutus and his almost obsessive use of the word I, uh, correlated often with people who are narcissistic, uh, obsessed with themselves. Brutus is subjective, he's introspective, he's private. His interiority makes him judge everyone by his own standards. To believe everyone is as rational and honorable as he, which is a huge mistake. And this leads directly, of course, to catastrophe in the play. Caesar's equally insistent depersonalization of self has its own risks. His use of images that have consistency, fixity, and majesty have some truth. And when he falls, it's as if Olympus has lifted and shaken itself from its place and plunging the whole world into disorder and confusion. Caesar's refusal to acknowledge a private flesh and blood self with private needs is a rejection of his personal self, and it denies uh, his, his, that sort of side of him, and it leads to his downfall. If he would have had this self-awareness, uh, perhaps things would have been different. Uh, human warnings aren't the only ones that are ignored and scorned in the play. The soothsayer's warning is brushed aside. He's merely a dreamer. The play indeed is full of dreams. Uh, prophecies and superstitions. They're all elements of the irrational, but these signs of a world are profoundly unnatural and are dangerously disregarded, misconstrued, or misinterpreted. Quote, men may construe things after they have fashion, that is, as they wish, and as in their character. So Caesar, Cassius, and Brutus do. Uh, quote, alas, thou hast misconstrued everything. Uh, Titinius speaks to Cassius's dead body. It's a fitting epitaph for the whole play. Brutus uh, is maybe never correct uh, throughout, and yet he is always insistent that he is. And had Brutus listened to Cassius more often, again, the play and history may have been different. There is blatant misconstruction. Uh, Brutus deliberately offers a misinterpretation of Calpurnia's dream. The dream is a sign that Romans of the future will come to Caesar for reviving blood or inspiration, as if he were a Christian saint. This, too, will come true in play as Antony makes a relic of Caesar's robe with its stab wounds. The triumvirs use the name of Julius Caesar then as a rallying cry for their own power struggle. Signs in Shakespeare's plays are morally neutral. They exist to be interpreted. For Caesar to heed Calpurnia's dream and save himself would be to show the very self-knowledge, the very awareness of his own human frailty that he so conspicuously lacks. The fault in Caesar is that he does not recognize his own human vulnerability. The fault of Brutus is that he convinces himself that his own sense of honor and reason, his private code, can be used to govern the state and to justify murder, the ends justifying the means here. Brutus consistently makes kind of a cosmetic error in interpretation. For one, he has convinced himself in a curiously passive and dispassionate phrase that it must be by his death. He begins to speak uh, the assassination of Caesar as ceremony, as that is, an aspect of order rather than of disorder and chaos. Brutus is trying to divide the indivisible, to make murder something holy, to make ceremony of it, uh, and to avoid the reality of uh, the sanctifying disorder that is murder and assassination. We hear the word ceremony over and over, and it's a way of avoiding reality, I think, for Brutus. It's a shield behind which he hides from the truth. He's murdering his friend. The minute Caesar is dead, Brutus suggests yet another ceremony, one that brings to literal life on stage the events of Calpurnia's dream. This is a stunning moment that would be remembered by the principles of the French Revolution and by Karl Marx. What Cassius predicts is nothing less than the play itself. As Cassius and Brutus are soon to learn, they have killed the wrong Caesar. They have killed the private man, one of flesh and blood, but the public man who becomes a myth lives on after death, after theirs, and after Shakespeare's too. Quote, Julius Caesar 
thou art mighty yet. There was a real fear that usurpation could lead to decades of instability. And of course, Brutus commits this crime to save the Republic, and the irony is that Rome descends into an empire uh, from that day forward. The plebeians are a swayable chorus, as people are today, too. They're a malleable audience to be played upon as they first cheer Brutus, and then 41 lines later, Antony, despite their contradictory speeches. And Brutus, unlike Antony, has too many scruples, too many principles to think of trying to be clever. It is Antony who says to the plebs, as if he had heard Act One, Scene One's taunts, quote, you are not wood, not stones, but men. Antony is the spirit of misrule, of chaos and anarchy. Misrule is the natural consequence of the murder of rule. And Antony's assumption of command, immediately following Caesar's death, is a sign of the conspiracy's failed notion. In mock ceremony, shaking their bloody hands, Antony names the conspirators one by one in a roll call of doom. Notice how he grabs the hand of the last one, once clean and now blood-soaked. Antony's words, when alone to the corpse, show the conspirators as butchers, despite Brutus's claim of peace, freedom, and liberty, lines imperative later on, by those in the French Revolution. They try, Brutus does, to identify as a sacrificer, and to make it clear that Caesar's spirit uh, will range for revenge and cry havoc, and Antony says this will lead to the dogs of war slipping. Antony is a master orator who feels the pulse of the crowd, as all good speakers must, and his delight in fate to disorder keeps him bound from scruples as Brutus is. Antony enters with the plebeians and is identified with their energies before he rises to speak in evocative, repetitious poetry, incantatory and easy to follow. Each of his observations is punctuated with a refrain four times repeated. But Brutus says he was ambitious and Brutus is an honorable man. The sheer iteration here calls the appropriateness of the word into question. The speech is not typical of Shakespeare, but reveals demagoguery in action, being easy to follow, memorize, the exact language needed to move the shallow masses. Uh, and after ascending from the crown, Antony returns to them, working them like a modern politician, kissing babies, shaking hands, exposing the bloody gaping gown, Caesar's body, and reading his will to the heirs, of course, the citizens of Rome themselves. The quest for an heir is momentarily democratic. The new triumvirs then join in a counter-conspiracy entirely cold and calculating and heartless. Earlier, we see Metellus Simber, the poet, plead for his brother, and now brother damns brother and uncle damns nephew with the prick of a pen. So much for Brutus's humanistic fate in humankind. Antony's predilection for misrule puts him at a disadvantage as Octavius rises to be the era's new political master. Despite Antony's seniority, Octavius quickly moves from young to being in charge. When on the plane at Philippi, he contradicts Antony, but will do so. Five lines later, Antony calls Octavius casually Caesar. The play has come full circle. As potential heir, he'll avenge the memory of his uncle, even though he is less human than Julius was. After all, it is Octavius, not Antony, who speaks the final lines of the play. As always, the final couplet is a stage clearly, is a stage device, but uh, past the glories suggest he will plunder and tell heroic tales of this. Uh, the word happy in this passage is related to hap, or luck, as well as its more modern meaning of pleasure and joy. But how many theater goers feel happy after such loss, suicide? Octavius' final words point to a never-mended split between dispassionate ruler and tragic hero. Brutus, as the best of humanity, is dead. Caesar is strong and flawed, demigod is dead. Octavius is not dead, but also, in a sense, not alive like the former others. He's sober, calculating, self-controlled, machine-like new man, the modern politician, who replaces the ancient mythic hero of the past. The rules with excesses and blind spots are over, and the human energies and passions that mark Caesar and Antony are going to wane as Octavius rises in the next play, uh, Antony and Cleopatra. In many of Shakespeare's plays, the figure of the mirror is evoked as a mode of character revelation, or alternatively, as a social or cultural model. Here it is more ominous, as when Cassius offers himself to Brutus's mirror, his eye, your glass, is potentially dangerous. Cassius reflects back what he wants to see in his persuasion. The similarity in name to the Tarquin banishing Brutus' ancestor is used like a glass 
but Cassius faces a challenge in shifting to the present as he notes Brutus and Caesar have the same syllable count, metrical stress and weight. And so in this, the two are twins. Unspoken, however, is another name that works here too. Cassius, why? Implies Cassius may not stride the world too, like the Colossus. Earlier in twin scenes, Caesar does not yield to Calpurnia. Brutus does to famous statesman Cato's daughter, Portia. Later on, the pleb suggests a superstition, uh, as Brutus being the next Caesar, now it becomes a title. Roman names for men had three parts, traditionally. Uh, the first part is a personal name used by the immediate family. The second part indicated the family the person belonged to, the man. And the third part was a nickname. It was tradition. Female names just had one part feminine version, and then the family name. Slaves and foreigners had only one name until they were freed or gained citizenship. Those adopted, like Octavius, retained their full name of their new father with added on A-N-U-S, thus Gaius Julius Caesar Octavius, historically. In Shakespeare's source, it is not Brutus, it is Brutus, not Octavia, that contradicts Antony. This change is a deliberate one by Shakespeare, emphasizing the emergence of the strong, defiant, and shakable figure. And all the no-men named omen prophecy instances in the play, none is as striking as sin of the poet who dreamt of feasts with Caesar and who was mistaken for the conspirator center, as I did earlier when I was talking, and is beaten to death. This scene unveils the confusion that has fallen upon both. When times are bad, they are especially so for poets. Censorship, imprisonment of Ben Johnson, for example, the loss of his hand, tipping hat. Uh, we see the value a Caesarless world places on literature. None at all. The plebs would not, in bitter irony, even have read Senna's mediocre poetry. Like Melvolio, though in a different key, Brutus imputes to his letter an author different from the real world. Writing and speaking are powerful vehicles in play. Difficulty in communication, mixed and failed messages, disregard, omens, oblique, and inaccessible narratives are all part of the play's texture, a play where characters fail to make themselves understandable. Caesar's narrative about Antony's offering Caesar the crown is opaque speech one of incomprehension and only partially complete. What exactly did Anthony say? Now, exactly how did Caesar respond? How did the populace react? Cicero, a man of greatness and renown, is understood by only a few learned people who nod approvingly off stage. It's all Greek to Casca, the audience, Brutus, and Cassius. Caesar is the only character in the play who speaks the language of performance. When Caesar says, do this, it is performed a performative speech, not a phrase that both says something and does something. Uh, a performative speech is one that both says something and does something. I now pronounce you husband and wife. I W Sir Lancelot. The Olympic Games are open. I name this child such and such that baptisms ultimately will and shall are Caesar's words, Caesar's language, the language of monarchs and conquerors. Plays within the play include Antony's offering Caesar the crown. Brutus's hand-bathing and blood ceremony, Antony's ludicrous telling and shaking of the conspirators' hands, the reason versus passion funeral eulogies, and the final epitaph for Brutus. Each is an encapsulated artifact, a version of speech or gesture, artfully in contrast to the straightforward commands of Caesar. What does Caesar's ghost look like? Most have wounds displayed in productions, but Perhaps Caesar's ghost should be affable, unflappable, smiling, to terrify the mind and sight, an uncanny specter. The lessons here are elusive, its images refractive upon the viewer. In the modern era, what is to be learned? I'll leave that for you to reflect.